Hello everyone, I am Adela Pineda, the director of LILAS, um, and it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Roberto Carlos to this space. My thanks to Paloma Diaz, who organizes uh, these talks. The, the purpose of these talks is to, we have 160 or more affiliates here mm -hmm. at the Institute, and uh, we want to promote dialogues among faculty because you all faculty do this amazing research uh, in so many disciplinary uh, topics and, and so this is this is the moment where students and faculty come together to talk about them. Uh, professor Roberto Carlos is an assistant professor of government at, at UT. His research focuses on Latinx immigrant experience broadly. He's currently focusing on how Latinx immigrants and their children incorporate politically and how political institutions and the American public react to their attempts to create a place for themselves in the U.S. His presentation is going to be discussed uh, by Barbara Hines, who is the former director of the University of Texas Law School Immigration Clinic. Y si no me equivoco, a proud Lilas alumna. That's right. <laughs> so, an applause for that. Uh, I don't want to give... 1969. <laughs> I, um, I don't want to give more, uh, you know, preliminary introduction. I'm just going to quote the title of the presentation that is very timely, How the Trump Administration's Quota Policy Transformed Immigration Judging. Thank you, Carlos, and welcome to the Lilas. Uh, space. Beautiful. So uh, thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. I appreciate my department and our feel like people from malls to come out and everybody else here just for having me. Uh, so I'm going to tell you that uh, this project is a little bit different from the a lot of the traditional, quote unquote, traditional work I've been doing in my graduate studies, uh, but I really got interested out of uh, intellectual curiosity and largely sort of context environments. And so the talk is titled how the Trump administration's quota policy transformed immigration judging. So I'm giving you what's happened in the talk. This is what I'm gonna to try to convince you that this happened. Uh, and so this is co-authored work uh, from former colleagues at the University of Georgia. And it really, again, just started out as a project of curiosity, trying to understand what was happening during the Trump administration. Um, and so I kind of stumbled upon this topic in a, in a kind of an interesting way, which is really through a Netflix documentary called Immigration Nation that was really of a raw sort of exposure to the enforcement policy and the issues that immigrants are dealing with. So I got really curious, really sad, to be honest, too, as well. And I wanted to understand what was happening in these spaces. Uh, so I started digging around, and I noticed that around 2018, there's this graph, and I don't have it, uh, but there's a certain type of deportation that just started skyrocketing. I mean, it looks like a rocket ship when you look at the graph in terms of the spike. And so I had this really wonderful graduate student, Elise Blazingame, who was my RA, and I was like, I want you to not worry about anything else I told you to worry about. Get all this data for me and let's figure out what's happening. Uh, and then I started our conversations with Christy Boyd, who is a law and courts person, and then we wrangled uh, Joe Ornstein out of the project uh, to really help us flush out a lot of the data and sort of big data analysis that we're doing. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of start by a, a couple of things. If I point out the obvious, a couple of things that y'all are all familiar with is that the Trump administration really, and even the Trump candidacy, really made immigration a central part of, uh, of its talking points, right? So during the announcement and these pejorative things he had said about Latinx Americans, which I won't repeat, uh, to the, the promise of like the border wall showing up, and then once in office you see the Trump administration push forward things like what we call colloquially the Muslim ban or getting rid of DACA uh, that you know was rolled out under the Obama administration and then even things as uh, sort of uh, um, sort of like the not sort of but the family separation policy after they got rid of what we would call uh, catch and release uh, and so this was kind of a theme that we were all fully aware of in fact when I click to the next slide these are the attention-getting administrative orders or executive orders that everybody was talking about the first week out of the gate of the Trump administration, right? So the border wall executive order with the formal title there, the enforcement policy executive orders with the formal policy there, including increasing ICE, uh, the amount of ICE agents that are available, and then again what we colloquially call the Muslim ban or the protecting the nation from terrorist acts by foreign nationals. And so again, these get all of the attention, and rightfully so, but what's happening behind the scenes is there's also a lot of administrative or executive actions that are happening. 
Uh, and so Trump uh, introduces, during his administration, 472 different administrative changes. So these are not administrative orders. These are in the terms of the capacity as the, ch the, ex the chief executive to enforce the law, where you tinker with how you're going to enforce the laws that are currently on the books. And so you know, the, the Migration Policy Institute does a really good job of, of, tr of charting all of this stuff. And we're going to focus in one area of policy here, which is the DOJ, the Department of Justice. Because one of the changes that happened and kind of flew under the radar was the Trump administration's attempt to use immigration courts in order to achieve his political goal of deporting more individuals. Um, and so this idea that you can use immigration courts to bend to your political will as president have been attempted before. Uh, famously, George W. Bush really tried to do this when he tried to politicize the hiring process of uh, immigration judges, who we're going to call IJs. Um, and you know, Barack Obama kind of tinkered on, on this on the edges with things like the rocket docket or the dedicated docket where you sped up the, the asylum cases that were being produced. Uh, and so they didn't really have a lot of success in terms of achieving their policy outcomes in terms of increasing deportations. And you could argue that Obama really didn't have that. He just wanted to increase the process of, of people going through these cases. But Trump is going to introduce this quota policy, and I'll get into more depth about what it is, but it's basically going to tell you that if you're an immigration judge, you have to knock out X amount of cases, and only so many of those cases can be overturned on appeal, or we call appeal and remand, right? So uh, that's where going to be the central focus is going to be here. And so to preview what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to argue that presidents are generally ill-equipped to be able to get immigration courts to do their bidding. Uh, even though they've attempted to do this in a variety of ways. Uh, but the Trump administration's 2018 quote-unquote quota policy is going to actually be a pretty powerful exception to that. And so the research questions that we're going to look at really are, number one, has the quota policy increased IJ or immigration judges' responsiveness to the Trump agenda? The title of the talk should su suggest that we think yes. And then the questions then are, well, how are IJs, IJs, excuse me, immigration judges, attempting to meet these goals that Trump has set for them? Uh, and then really important, I don't want to lose sight of the people who are involved behind these cases, is what does that mean for those individuals seeking relief? The average non-citizen immigrant who's in front of this court asking for relief. Um, so for those of you who may not be super familiar with immigration judges, you might ask yourself, well, why would Trump be able to do this with this group or he wouldn't be able to do it with other types of judges? Well, so immigration judges are different from Article III judges, right? So Article III judges are the ones that we hear about in our intro to government class. They have, are they're, you know, written in the Constitution under Article III, and the big thing they have is a lifetime appointment, right? So uh, what they're, what's happening here is the idea is to inoculate these judges from the politics of people or even administrations or other pressures and they're supposed to rule on the merits of the case. Uh, whether they do or not is a different story, but that's the idea, right, that they're inoculated from that. Uh, immigration judges are also not Article I judges, right? So Article I judges are a little bit more unique. They're, we refer to them as administrative judges. They're also protected. While they don't have lifetime appointments, they have a lot of protections in place to make sure that that process is not politicized. And additionally, if you wanted to remove an immigration judge, or excuse me, an uh, administrative judge, an Article I judge, you have to convene a special panel. It's, it's really tough to do, as the Administrative Procedures Act suggests. And the, the thing about uh, uh, immigration judges is they are in a unique position. So they are hired by the Attorney General. Uh, so the Attorney General works for the President of the United States, uh, and the Attorney General is responsible as head of the DOJ, the Department of Justice, to determine who's going to be hired and, in essence, fired. And to give you a sense of the structure of the DOJ, uh, the, on top of the DOJ, again, is the head, the Attorney General, and right here you have this office called the Executive Office of Immigration Review, OOIR. Uh, and so there's going to be a little bit of attention that I want to draw your uh, attention to here in terms of immigration judges and who their boss is. Right? So, the Executive Office of Immigration Review is a subset, as you, you just saw, of the DOJ. But the, the Executive Office of uh, Immigration Review, their chief goal is to remove individuals from the country, right? Their job is to deport people. They are going to argue on behalf of the federal government that immigrants don't have claims to stay here if they don't have status and they should be deported. And the people that are responsible for that also employ 
the immigration judge, right? So there's a natural tension that exists there where you know you have the person deciding whether you get to stay or not, whose bo your boss is actually just trying to remove people uh, constantly, right? So keeping that in mind, let me get back to our question just so I can refocus you. So again, has the quota policy increased IJ responsiveness to the Trump administration's agenda? And if so, how are immigration judges actually attempting to do this, and what does it mean for those seeking relief? So a couple of reasons we want to think about this, uh, the, the tension between presidents or even the attorney general and immigration judges. It basically becomes a, a principal agent problem, right? So in the traditional principal agent setup, you're going to have a principal, like the president in this case, or even the attorney general, who's going to be able to tell the agents, their employees, what they want them to do, right? They'll be able to do it because they can monitor them. They'll be able to do it because they can choose who they're going to hire. Uh, and they can do it through threat because they can maybe fire you. Uh, and that's sort of the idea that would, we would expect to see with this IJ president relationship, but it doesn't work that way traditionally because IJs, like other street level bureaucrats, have, are, are very hard to monitor and punish for a variety of reasons, and I'll get into just a few of them to really highlight the problems of the principal agent problem. But the research has told us that presidents are typically weak principals when it comes to monitoring immigration judges because. Number one, there's a really high caseload. It's just tough to keep an eye on whatever an immigration judge is doing. Number two, the process to hire an immigration judge is de depoliticized. Again, George W. Bush famously tried to tinker with this and was told that that was not appropriate. Uh, so it, there's a pretty standard way to hire these individuals. And even though IJs are subject to being fired because they're at will employees, they are still bureaucrats. So you just don't get to say you're fired you have to go through a process that's really difficult uh, to untangle. So these things suggest that it's just difficult to get immigration judges to do what you want if you're the president or even the attorney general. Additionally, the federal law tells immigration judges that they're supposed to have independent judgment and use their discretion. And so what we have before this study is a whole host of past empirical studies that tell us that IJs are very difficult to constrain in this principal agent relationship. And so overall, the reason they're so difficult to constrain is because a lot of immigration judges, like other judges up until this quota policy, are going to have the ability to make decisions based off preferences, traits, even sort of personalities, right? They get to d determine a lot about how they're going to rule on their bench. So fast forward, under the Trump administration, there's this uh, this report that comes out from the U.S. Government Accounting Office, the GAO, and it's going to present Trump with what's on its face a neutral facing policy recommendation, which is you need to start closing immigration cases. There's currently a backlog of roughly 1.2 million cases. There's too many. We need to do something about that. So the Trump administration seizes on this to then implement this policy that I'm going to talk to you about in just a second. Uh, and really what the argument that we're making here is that they're going to use this neutral facing government report from the GAO to implement their performance plan, but this is going to be a political plan, right? So what happens is the Executive Office of Immigration Review decides it's going to institute a performance plan to deal with the backlog of cases. So the reason I have Jeff Sessions here is because he's the Attorney General at the time working for President Trump, and he was heavily involved in formulating this plan. And in the plan, you have a couple things that are going to happen according to the DOJ on October 1st, 2018. In your performance plan, the way you're going to get a satisfactory rating is if you close 700 cases a year, right? In addition to that, only 15% of those cases can be remanded, so overturned on appeal. And to, I'm going to complicate this a little bit further by telling you really quickly how the appeals process works for uh, an immigrant seeking relief at the court. If I'm an immigrant who's here without documentation and I go in front of the court, and I say I have a legitimate claim to stay, the immigration judge can shoot me down. It's not over for me. I have the ability to appeal. I would appeal then to what's called the BIA, the Board of Immigration Appeals. The problem with the BIA, it is also housed under the EOIR, so the DOJ. And the attorney general gets to handpick who's going to sit on those appeals panels. So you, the deck's already stacked against you. If I don't succeed there, I do have one more option, but then I appeal to the federal court system, the federal court of appeals. Uh, so just keep that in mind because I'm going to come back to that. But again, satisfactory review, 700 cases, and only 15% of those can be overturned. 
I'm going to flip to the other side. There is a middle point here, but let's go to the bottom of an unsatisfactory performance review. If you do not close at least 560 cases or 20% of your case, 20 of your caseload is overturned on appeal, you're going to get an unsatisfactory rating. Again, why does this matter? Because, again, immigration judges are higher. They, they, are, they are able to be fired, and so that's an important part. So you want to be able to be seen as doing your job. Additionally, they want to be promoted. Right? Like anybody else, they want raises. They want maybe the opportunity to sit as a uh, chief immigration justice. Uh, and so to do that, you have to have good reports. So there's going to be a lot of incentive for them to behave with this policy. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, what is the average caseload happening before this policy goes into effect? Just to give you a sense of this, about two-thirds of the courts had a per-judge caseload of under 700 per year, right? So not a lot of people are meeting this goal of 700 cases. Additionally, two-fifths were below 500. And so there's a lot of variation here. We had some immigration judges that have under 300 cases, some that have over 1,000. And I think the thing to keep in mind is that not every immigration case is alike. Right? So some are really complicated, some are pretty straightforward, and that might determine what's happening. Also, some of the circuits are busier than others, and that might also complicate things. So to say this, there should be a standard approach uh, becomes really difficult to sort of understand what's happening. Right? And so again, Trump's going to be called out, or the Trump administration is going to be called out by people who see this as super problematic for judicial discretion and independence in the immigration court system. So they're going to talk about things like that this is currently being used as a political tool. They're going to talk about judicial independence. Uh, or even this last quote here, which says Sessions is treating them like immigration officers, not judges. So the idea is basically you now have another ICE agent at your disposal to be willing to dispose of uh, these individuals, right? In addition, again, I don't want to forget about the people behind the cases. If you're asking immigration judges to speed up the process, there's going to be shortcuts that happen when it comes to due process. Uh, and if people don't get to take their time and have their case heard on the merits, uh, and there's not real due process, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be hurt by this. So let's get to the expectations, right? So finally get to them. So what I want to do is point out that there's going to be two things that we expect to happen post-policy. So again, the policy was going to go into effect October 1st, 2018. So the first thing we expect is to have an increase in abstention removals. For those of you who don't know what those are, I will tell you in just a second, so bear with me. But uh, the absent part is a big part of this. So we expect to see a big increase in, in absentia removals issued when the petitioner does not appear. You can imagine what happens if you don't show up for your court case on time. But additionally, post quota, we expect removal cases at large to just start uh, also increasing because uh, immigration judges have their marching orders. They know what's expected of them, and they're going to react because, again, they're going to have these policy or these performance goals that they have to meet. Uh, and they, again, are human beings who like to keep their jobs, right? Uh, so keep that in mind. So let's tell you what an abstention removal is with a little bit more understanding. If I can get this thing to work. Whoops. Okay. So in abstention removal orders, bottom line is if you are an immigrant seeking relief who doesn't have documentation, or maybe you do have documentation but it's contingent on some kind of status, uh, if you don't show up for your court case, Immigration, immigration judges have the ability to just deport you in abstention. So you are absent, so you are deported. In fact, the law says shall be ordered deported in abstention. We can talk about how much wiggle room immigration judges have. We argue they actually have quite a bit. Uh, so they don't actually always deport everybody in abstention. But all of a sudden with this new performance plan, if you have to close 700 cases a year, Guess what? Once you deport somebody in absentia, your case is closed and you can move on to the next one. That's one down really quickly. So we argue that a lot of immigration judges are going to start using an absentia removals as a tool of efficiency, right? To just start banging cases out. The other part of this is, again, you, have, you can only have so many overturned on appeal. It's going to be less likely to overturn uh, in absentia cases on appeal because there's very definite, like there's a scope uh, that you have to stay in if you have uh, if you want to appeal your case, you can only basically have about four conditions, there might be a little bit more, but four conditions that would actually allow you to have your case overturned. If you don't meet those scope conditions, uh, the, court, the appeals court cannot hear your case, so it's done. Uh, so we think that's what's going to happen with an absentia removal. I'm going to have to stand up, this is awkward. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so in terms of the merit-based appeals, as I knock stuff down, uh, so here we just think that people are going to respond as human beings again to what's happening uh, and they are understanding that there is there's marching orders 
that we need to increase the amount of cases and that a lot of them need to be uh, deportations because the likelihood of them surviving the appellate process is going to be very difficult, particularly when, again, the BIA, which is still housed under the EOIR, I know I'm throwing a lot of acronyms, sorry, but again, if you're an immigrant who wants to appeal your first case decision, if you lost, you still have to stay within the, the agency to appeal the Board of Appeals, but those are created again, or the, those are, there's a lot of hand, uh, or a lot of ability for the, the Attorney General to have a lot of influence in that process. Okay, so why do we expect the quota policy uh, to increase removals? Uh, kind of a, sum, summarizing what I've basically said, pre-quota, we argue that immigration judges just have a lot more discretion. Uh, there's not really anybody monitoring them or threatening them with sanctions. There is, you know, a call, hey, we would wish you would speed up this case, but beyond that pressure, there's not anybody actually trying to sort of put their foot on people's neck to sort of hurry this up. Now this is happening with the performance policy. And so what we expect to happen here is that we expect Democratic judges are going to start expending more energy to start deporting because they have to start making up for their deficits. So I underline Democrat because for those of you who are familiar with a lot of the law and courts literature, uh, we don't really get a sense of what people's partisan identity traditionally is. We do here, and we'll show you how we do that in just a second. So this is not like a Democratic judge because Obama appointed them. It's because they are literally registered Democrats. Uh, so we'll come back to that in just a second. But we expect that this is going to be where you're going to see the most movement because Republicans are likely to be in line with the goal of deporting more people. Uh, and so there's going to be ceiling effects is what we're going to argue here. So uh, moving on here. All right, so the case uh, data. So the EOI case data is all available for free. You just have to FOIA it all the time. Uh, and I think like Syracuse's track like program just annoyed the DOJ enough to where they just started publicly making it available. Uh, but this is very unwieldy data, right? Like we have a lot of cases. And so we're going to look at immigration cases starting January 1st, 2012. So we want an Obama uh, administration here. And then we want to capture a Trump administration. Although we did stop after COVID because a lot of immigration courts just shut down. And we wanted to not have to worry about what, was that, that, was, what that was doing to our analysis. And so we're going to look at about 335 immigration judges and about 300,000 cases they completed. So you might be asking yourself, well, how many immigration judges are there? Uh, so by the end of 2018, there was about 395 immigration judges. So we don't have all of them, but there's a reason we focus on these 333 and I'll explain why. Additionally, we're just looking at single petitioners and we're just looking at completed cases from the immigration judge standpoint. Uh, we are not in the analysis worried about what happened to the people who appealed. We just want to know how the first person, uh, the first immigration judge you dealt with, determined the outcome of your case. All right, an uh, independent variable, I think I want to miss something, did I miss something, did I miss something? No, I did not. So uh, dependent variables, so the, the, the things that the outcome variables were really focused on was whether the judge ruled in absentia or not, or whether the judge removed uh, the, the immigrant seeking uh, relief uh, on the merits. So yes or no, right? And then key independent variables, so we are going to look at the quota policy pre-post. So the reason we focus on those 335 is because we're looking at their behavior before the quota policy, and then we're looking at the behavior after, right? So we're looking at the average treatment effect on the treated, basically. We're treating this as an intervention that happens. Uh, and if you were only around post-policy, we don't care about you as an immigration judge in our data, right? And if you're only around pre-policy, we don't care. We want you to be in both spaces to see what this policy is doing to you. Uh, and so, additionally, again, we have judge partisanship. And I really want to touch on this partisanship angle because I think a lot of uh, people sort of are misunderstanding what we're trying to do. And so for those of you who are not familiar with this, this is uh, L2 data. And so L2 will tell us who is registered in every single state. And we have the ability to determine who the Republicans are, who the Democrats are. Uh, and we can talk more about the, what's happening behind the scenes uh, in just a second if you want to or in the Q&A. Uh, but if you were going to look for an immigration judge, and we have all of their information, their name, where they live, etc. So fake immigration judge that I made up, you can't even see your name, Monica Robinson. We pretend there's only four for the example. Two Monicas are Republicans, two Monicas are Democrats, but we're, we're worried about the immigration judge in Denton. So we're going to click on Monica Robinson in Denton, and what we're going to find here is that she's a Republican. And we know how often she's voted in the state of Texas, etc. Right? So again, this is party ID of the individual judge. A lot of previous research uh, relies on maybe judge donations, but a lot of immigration judges don't donate to parties. 
or they de rely on appointing president of the immigration judge, but because of the, the case election that happens about who actually becomes an immigration judge, that's not really a good predictor. Uh, and some people try to compile like ideology scores based off their background. Uh, we don't think that they hold up to us. We don't really talk about that in the paper because we don't want to you know, trash anybody, but we just don't think it's a good measure as opposed to this. We think this really taps into ideology. Additionally, we control for things that are really important, although I have the, I noticed the coding backwards, but whether you have legal representation or not, or you're, it's pro se, right? So pro se, you're, rep you're representing yourself. So legal representation is obviously gonna matter a lot. We're gonna look at legal representation interacted with the policy impacted, whether you're an English speaker, because that has a lot of impact on how you uh, get treated, whether you are a Mexican or Central American immigrant versus everybody else, whether they're asylum cases, whether you're in custody or not, and then we do have judge level fixed effects, which I'm happy to also show you those as well. All right, so the methods, again, what we're really just trying to do here, you can think of it as a, a, a discontinuity design. It's a little bit more complicated because there's a time component because immigration judges were aware that this was coming down the road. It wasn't like they just sprung it on them. Uh, so we take into that for account. So we, we use what's called an interrupted time series approach. But really what we want to do is again, how was the judge behaving before the policy was implemented, and how are they behaving after the policy is implemented? And so trying to sum up the data here, we're just going to, I'm going to ask you not to ignore the graph for just a second. Uh, so in absentia removals, right? So right now we're just looking at those without legal representation. But before the policy was in the place, immigration judges were deporting people about 38% of the time. Once the policy came into place, that increased to 51.9%. So there's almost a 14 percentage point increase in the amount of in absentia deportations. Uh, and so, again, that suggests that there's some there there happening. And we also argue that we think most of the change is going to happen with Democrats compared to Republicans. And we can see here that Democrats are almost 19 percentage points more likely to start using in absentia removals after the policy than they were before. And so what this graph is trying to tell you is trying to give you a sense of this discontinuity. So, the dark, or the, I know it's hard to see, but this uh, solid line here is the October 1st date. And then the little dashes on this one is a year after the fact, the year before. And that's where we're really focusing on that difference. Here, Republicans are still using this a lot more than they were pre-policy at 9 percentage points. So there's a pretty natural discontinuity that we see. Now, uh, this is the table accounting for all cases. And you can see here that post-policy, uh, all immigration judges are going to start moving to using in absentia removal orders a lot more by significant margins, right, compared to what they were doing pre-policy. And again, this is true for Republican judges. This is true for Democrats, even accounting for all of these other host variables that we looked at. Obviously, they matter, right? Legal representation matters. Uh, asylum cases matter. All of these other things matter. Uh, but the policy is still having this uh, large substantive effect. And you can see here, these are the... Uh, the uh, estimated uh, conditional average treatment effects. And so again, those without representation are really driving a lot of what's going on here. All judges in black, there's a significant difference. Uh, Democrats, there are significant differences. And there is a significant difference here, uh, but again, that's being muted compared to everybody else. Uh, so it's, there's clearly this is what's happened in terms of in absentia removals. They're using this as a tool of efficiency. So when it comes to removals on the merits, uh, it gets a little bit more muted, right? So there's no obvious discontinuity happening on these removal on the merits cases. Uh, so there are significant differences, and I'll point to them, but uh, there's clearly no obvious like discontinuity that we can point to. Um, I will point to this, I'm going to bring it up in just a second. They're already deporting people here about roughly 90% of the time, right? So there's very uh, little place to go here in terms of increasing your amount of deportations, right? So when you look at the removals on the merits, you don't see an effect for the policy. Interestingly, and we didn't really think about this if we're being completely honest, there is an effect for post-policy with legal representation. So what happens is those with, uh, without attorneys were already losing these cases on the merits. Uh, that's what was happening. But it seems to have gotten tougher post-policy, even with an attorney, to win these cases. So it seems like immigration judges did sort of toughen their stances and were maybe their behavior suggested to get an attorney you may get some more grace, it seems to be less the case. Uh, and you can see that a little bit here with, again, this is now the legal representation where you see a lot of the movement happening. Uh, and again, we think that there's ceiling effects happening with Republicans, so there's not much more else for them to go. They were already at 
but Democratic judges are moving, and overall judges are moving. Um, so, uh, let's see here. So discussion, so I'm going to start wrapping up because I clearly went by really fast because I was excited to talk. Uh, but I want to end with a couple things. First of all, this quote right, from a former immigration judge. Evaluating someone's performance on the number of cases they close is obviously going to have some effect on the substance of the decisions. You know the boss wants removals, not grants. Right? So this, and there's a lot of former immigration judges that are pointing to this as super problematic uh, and why maybe uh, it's important to revisit the, tr the Trump quota policy even though it's no longer... Uh, in existence. So really I think that the, the, what I want you to take away here is sort of what are the implications because Trump the, or the Trump administration was able to find a way to use politics to dictate what was happening in what was supposed to be a neutral space, right? Uh, where due process is supposed to play out and not politics, but it seems like it, if under the right conditions you can actually uh, it, impact what's happening in these cases. Uh, and so what does this mean for judicial independence? And sure, for the immigration courts, but maybe at large. In fact, I was reading the Washington Post headline about how uh, Republicans are thinking that they need to start putting more pressure on bureaucrats when it comes to spending in general. So maybe this may be a roadmap for them to point to as a successful way to do that. Uh, and again, even though Biden did eventually, much later than people had hoped, I think, uh, but did eventually roll back the, the performance plan policy, uh, He's still focused on backlog. This is why you've seen the changes in asylum uh, rules, and this is why you see this idea of maybe reintroducing this, this thing they call the rocket docket, right, or the dedicated docket. Uh, so that's what's going on. And then importantly, and I think, again, it's really easy to lose sight of this, especially in like a political science paper like this, is like what is happening uh, to the individuals who are seeking relief, where the stakes are literally, in a lot of cases, life and death, uh, and then the system is already super complex. Um, you know, I know I have Professor Hines here who's probably going to tell me, oh, you got this wrong about the immigration system and this wrong, because it's super complicated, and I've been digging into it uh, now for over a year, and it's not easy to understand, and so when someone who doesn't have this expertise has to navigate it, it becomes really difficult, and then it only becomes amplified uh, when you add the politics on top of the policy. Uh, so on that note, uh, I really appreciate your patience. I'm looking forward to Dr. Hines' comments, and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. I thought you had a great mastery of the immigration system. Oh, thank you. So I thought that was really great. You did much better thank than you. many of the students in, after a semester or two in the immigration clinic. I appreciate it. So that, that was great. So I'm... Um, hey, I'm going to take notes on my phone. I don't want you to think I'm texting. So I apologize. <laughs> that part. <laughs> so, um, no, I was fascinated by your paper uh, for many reasons. You know, I think a lot of us uh, that are the immigration advocates don't do the statistical analysis piece. So I thought that part was uh, so interesting, also looking at immigration judges from their uh, political views. Um, but I, I think I had one um, question that I want to ask you, uh, particularly about the second uh, piece, which is your statistical analysis about the um, increase in denials on the merits and whether you do think that that is due solely to the um, to these these quotas that Trump um, impo uh, imposed, because that was also at the same time, and I noticed that you didn't really test for that, and that was at the same time that the attorney general was overturning all of these asylum decisions. Because one of the other things that the Trump administration did, in addition to all of this stuff in opposing the quotas is that he had an unprecedented policy of overturning BIA decisions that were favorable to immigrants in the asylum context, in terms of discretionary relief, in terms of postponing cases, which limited judges' discretion. And when you were saying that there was really little wiggle room and when you said that um, it was cases in which people were represented by lawyers, I wondered if the explanation for that was not really this number of cases, but really the change in the law and that those immigration judges had so little room. And was that something that you considered? No, I'll be honest. I don't think that's something. We, we sort of try to do uh, these placebo tests to account for what are these things that we looked at, like when uh, asylum uh, seeker, or, uh, that stuff increased, but I don't think we looked at that, that policy area specifically, and it's worth thinking about how 
maybe that's driving some of these results on the merits. Uh, because I think what you're saying is, uh, even though we're only worried about the first phase, uh, if you're an immigration judge and you're looking at the BIA and they've overturned all these cases, maybe you need to readjust your attitude? Well, I think what I'm saying is that at the same time that Trump was imposing these quotas, mm -hmm. um, Sessions was overturning favorable Board of Immigration Appeals decisions about asylum. Right. Absolutely at the same time. And so they got rid of domestic violence mm -hmm. asylum. They got rid of social group yeah. asylum. You could no longer postpone uh, cases if you have other, had other relief and you were waiting for your visa number. And that meant that immigration judges could no longer grant asylum at the first level. Right, right. At the first right. level. And so I'm wondering if that is why you saw yeah. cases being denied at the first level more rather than because of this. No, right. Or so it was yeah. some of the same. No, no, so no, that was my main comment yes. on the second um, portion of these statistics. Yeah, so no, I think you're right. And maybe uh, sort of, so we, we do control for asylum applications, uh, but maybe looking at whether there's interaction or there's a specific date that we could target uh, to see. So the answer is no, we haven't considered it fully. We need to think about that a little bit more. So I appreciate right. that. Yeah, and then of course, I thought this was such a helpful pa paper for those of us that are um, advocating for Article Three judges. And so I wonder, whether you are going to make any policy recommendations in your paper about Article Three or uh, judges, or do you think this is just something that uh, the, those of us that are advocates um, can do with this paper? Yeah, so, uh, so I appreciate the question, I really do. And I think uh, in this paper, I don't think that we're looking to make policy prescriptions, mm -hmm. but I think in an ideal world, people can use this paper yes to advocate and say, look, here's evidence suggests that this is having a detrimental impact on what's happening in regards to judicial independence, uh, real world evidence, uh, and we should take these and run with it. We, we're sort of hoping for more of that to be the case. Right. We will call it out, and I think we're gonna flush this out a little bit sure. further to be like, this is really important, we should, we need, here's a signpost for you, uh, but I think we're a little hesitant as political scientists to right. be like, here's the policy you should make, or let me rephrase that. I am a little hesitant. There's a lot of political scientists who would happily make that recommendation. <laughs> no, because that's what I thought was such an important part of this study was that what it could be used for for those people that have been thinking for so long that we really need to take these immigration judges out of the Department of Justice as you were started talking about in the beginning mm -hmm. that this is really they work for the same uh, boss who. Um, hires the government attorneys that are making the arguments in front of the immigration judges that people should be deported. Yeah, again, yeah. But as I said, I was fascinated by thinking about the political views of the immigration judges because when we look at those judges, we're really, um, I think, immigration practitioners and, and academics really look at what their profession was before. Did they come from did they come up through the Department of Justice and were they previously trial attorneys or were they ICE attorneys or were they in private practice or did they work for nonprofits? Uh, I never looked at whether they were Democrats or Republicans. Yeah, so just to your point, so this is actually the next phase. We've been pushed on this a little bit uh, because a lot of the work does look at, again, what they call ideological measures in their life. But did they work uh, for yes. uh, nonprofits that they work for? Yeah. And so we we tinkered with this, and it doesn't seem like those 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 were, those things are not having an impact on what we're showing you. But we're gonna have to now show you that on a full scale, and probably even try to interact it. Because right now all we did is sort of control for these things as fixed effects. So whether the judge was a Republican, again, this is like a multi-level model. This is a little bit different, right? So it doesn't matter about how many cases they have on their docket. It doesn't matter how long they've been judges. Uh, and, and so that's. But the question is, were they maybe working for ICE or uh, in some capacity? And that's the next phase where we're going to look at uh, interrogate that. So we literally just finished collecting all of the uh, data and coding it with all 335 and, and their biography. So that's definitely the next yeah, step. Yeah, and I'm happy to talk about do this separately because sometimes some of us are very surprised at those people that we think are the Democrats, uh, previously nonprofit lawyers that turn out to be the harshest to the immigrants. Yeah. But maybe we should open it up to other I have a question questions. online here uh, from Professor Sergio Romero, Department of Spanish and Portuguese in Vilas. 
he says, he's saying this. Great talk, Roberto, thanks. Do you have judge decision data by state? Are there states in which judges are friendlier in their deportation decisions? Also, do you have data on how judges, uh, how they judge in ethnicity and race, how that correlates with deportation decisions? And I have a question that's very close to this one, is if there's any data, if they, for instance, the location, the course, they're closer to the border where the mm -hmm. clients are more likely to be poorer than people yeah. arriving, if there's a higher level of denials, and how much they're taking into consideration income level, education level of the clients. There. Yeah, so, so thank you for that, uh, Professor Romero. And, and uh, so, so you, you, it sounds like you've been reading our, uh, our, our, our revise and revision memos from, from people, right? So this is the next step, which is like, again, uh, can you point to the differences in these judges? And so again, we're looking to do that again. What is their background? What is their ethnic makeup? How long have they been in office? Uh, do they have prosecutorial experience or were they working for nonprofits? Uh, we also have a sense of, do they work for corporations or do they have a private practice? Uh, so we're looking at that. We're also, here we do control for circuit level effects, uh, which tries to account for those things that, like, if you have a more liberal court, because the answer is yes, there's going to be some courts uh, that are going to be more responsive to uh, certain cases versus other. And so we're going to flush that out in, in, in the next round of this iteration of the paper. So, so the short answer is, like, those things matter uh, to some extent, but we don't, based on the evidence that we've seen, we don't think it's going to sort of wash away the impact of the policy. And I think that's ultimately what's the, the biggest driver here is the policy just making people move, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, whether they were more likely to be ideologically aligned with the Obama administration or the Trump administration uh, doesn't seem to, to, to matter as much. Because again, people are responding to the sort of uh, carrot and stick approach that the Trump administration is using. Uh, so yeah, and we're working on that. There was a, there was a question here in the room. Hey, Great presentation. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking specifically back to this time because I was, I was working as a legal assistant at the time and I remember there was a lot of news specifically about judges that were choosing to retire mm -hmm. specifically in response to this policy. Um, and I was wondering, from what I see like in the track data that I'm looking at, it looks like you know 27 immigration judges retired in 2018. 2018-35. So I'm curious if you looked at those specific individuals at all, and if you did, if you noticed any interesting behavior with respect to the anticipated behavior that yeah. you were looking at. So, so the, the big focus again is whether we have the judge that has uh, case outcomes in both pre and post policy, right? Because we're we're trying to get causal leverage on this story, right? So that's that's the main focus. Uh, but if you look at each of these judges uh, independently we can tell ourselves some pretty post hoc wild stories about their behavior, mm -hmm. but on average, we just don't see that, right? So I've seen judges that we've identified a Republican who were deporting everybody in absentia, then the policy hit, and it literally goes to zero. Mm -hmm. And so they clearly had some adverse reaction. Maybe they were protesting about the policy uh, in some way, but in terms of like the data capturing that on average, uh, we just don't see that. And we, we, can, we haven't interrogated the data further enough to be like, what's happening at the individual level? We think it's super interesting, uh, but it's also tough to like come up with like a theoretical story about why 335 people are behaving differently right. on their own. Uh, so, so I don't have a sense of that. So again, on average, we're just looking were you here before and after the policy because we want to measure how you're behaving. Thank you for the question. It's a great question. Oh. Um, so I really enjoyed the talk, uh, Roberto. Um, so I, I actually got a couple of questions. So the first on the merit-based removals, uh, it was very interesting, the data on Mexican and, Mexican and Central American uh, versus English speakers and the deportations in Mexican and Central America, or the denials that went up for them, and for the English speakers went down. So I was going to ask if you could talk a little bit about that, and specifically, I'm interested to know what countries are the English speakers predominantly from, and if that's shaping that in part. Um, and then two, I was wondering if um, you have any data on removals um, post Biden, that is post the change in policy under Biden, um, because it'd be interesting to see if if that's sticky, you know, or if it actually does respond um, quickly to, to changes yeah. in policy. So so thank you. Uh, so uh, so uh, I will
will be honest and tell you that I did not interrogate the, like, the leading countries that the English speakers were coming from, but so we've been pushed a little bit and people want more uh, more clarity on beyond the Mexican versus Central American and everybody else. So uh, we're going to incorporate at least the next uh, largest group is going to be Chinese nationals. Uh, and then after that, we, we're willing to dummy it out to infinity because we really don't think it's going to have any impact ultimately in what's happening. Uh, I think this speaks, the English uh, language thing is just capturing the ability to navigate the system a little bit more efficiently, right? Uh, I think that's what's happening. But it could be interesting to see if, you know, we have a high level of, of undocumented um, individuals from Ireland, right? So it'd be interesting if maybe that they were successful on, on some issues compared to others. So so we, we, it's worth we're digging into that because it's a super interesting question that I honestly didn't think about. Um, so, so, yeah. if I could just follow, so you don't think it has anything to do with the bias that the Trump administration would have against Mexican, -American, Mexican and Central American immigrants as opposed to um, immigrants from other English-speaking countries. So, so it's hard. I mean, I think that that could play a part in it, but also a lot of the things think about who's coming from these these places, right? And so, like, how much access they have to things like uh, legal help, even English document. I mean, Spanish documents. Uh, and so, I think it, there's a lot of things happening there that I think it's maybe we could try to tease out a little bit better, uh, for sure. Uh, and I, I'm, I kind of lost your second one, and it was a good one. I just did. Oh, it was about the Biden. Revolution. Oh yes. So we have not looked at that specifically, and actually, there's a graduate student of mine in uh, my Latinx politics class who is going to do that for the class. I'm really curious about what happens and, and to see uh, what she finds. Uh, but if I had to guess, and just looking at the charts, you do start seeing a decline in absentia renewals. Uh, it's not as precipitous as the rise uh, that you saw, but it makes you wonder if people are, are, are no longer responding to the policy. They don't feel that that's over their head. Um, but isn't also this isn't also some of it the nature of the claim because the I mean the Central American Mexicans is domestic violence gang claims the cases the kinds of asylum claims that the more dif are the difficult ones to, to prove but I also think it is also that judges hear them over and over again, and so then I think it's that they're like, oh, not another one of these. And the English speakers, I mean, there is this whole idea of, oh, the Romanian case, oh, the Iranian, the difference in judges are more interested in those cases. There's all these like crazy psychological things that go on. I think that's right. That like you, it's just like one more Central American case in a judge's mind. I mean, obviously, it's a life and death matter, but I think that that's part of it, and the nature of the claims, and the fact that those are the most difficult ones, and that the and those were the cases where they undid all of those precedent decisions. No, no, no I think I mean, it's hard to tease out exactly what. I think there's a lot of stuff in there, right? And this is why we're kind of yeah. uh, cheating and say, well, we're just worried about the effect of the treatment, right? Uh, and it holds up to these things. Uh, but I think that's right. I think we could tell ourselves. Yeah. A lot, there's a lot happening yes. here. It, it could be bias. It could be the psychological things that you just get used to hearing a certain type of case, and you're just like, let's go on to the next one. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things that are happening that are. Tough it to would be that. interesting to see yeah. the interaction of post policy and English speaker to see if that. That would be. A, I, I agree. I was just gonna piggyback on this. I think your plots are really striking, and to get it to, to see these exact points instead of worrying about statistical interactions or whatever, you could just plot. The proportion of English speakers being deported over time by these types of different types of judges just have done the other cases or the other plots, and you could just see is it the case that what's driving some of the changes is actually just the increased volume, or is it the case that the Trump administration biases are reflected in the kinds of you know victims of these policy changes, right? The people that are ultimately being deported, or are they the types of individuals that Trump sort of seemed to focus on would be interesting to look at. You get to see that over time. That's a wonderful suggestion. Thank you, Mike. As always, by the way. I have a question about Cubans who for a long time enjoy a very privileged status regarding um, arrival to the U.S. and then the policy was changed. But I wonder if in the judge's minds, you know, sometimes mind frame yeah. changes slower than policy. <laughs> So do you think they still have a privilege? This is a great question, and you're really getting back to, I need you to interrogate this variable of Mexican and Central versus everybody else, and I think we do need to do a better job of saying, like, 
let's let's tease out these uh, individual characteristics to see if we can find some mm -hmm. some there there regarding the, the policy. Uh, so I, I honestly do not have a good answer because uh, there's just so so it's like I can't even say I eyeballed it right because there's 300 ca 300,000 cases and so I, I don't even have like a good answer right now but it, it's it's great to have these questions that we can then, we can then go back and think about the partners so thank you but if you, I'm super curious about that thought I'm gonna yeah, Roberto, this is great, super fascinating. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about any other demographics of the judges themselves that um, were much more or less sensitive to the quota policy. And I happen to see a little bit of a glimpse from one of your appendix tables where you actually have the uh, Latinx ethnicity. So we know it right from the loan courts kind of literature at right? one of the judges demographics in you know have an impact on their decisions and i think here you have on the removals is this the removals yeah which you didn't find much for the um sort of in 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 your earlier results can you talk a little bit about you know and if it's not just line x or you know yeah. the city of the judges but any other demographics of the judges that might be more or less sensitive to this i mean so so again, I think we, we, we need to go back and, and sort of look at the data now with the fact that we, and we just finished up the coding to get us a better sense of what's happening with these individual level characteristics that people are very curious about. Uh, but I think your thinking is even on, on point with Marcel's thinking who brought up this comment about, it's interesting that, in this case, you say Latinx is, he thought it was interesting, I, I agree, that uh, Democrats were behaving this way, right? Where, where the literature may suggest that this wouldn't be the group that would behave in this way, all of a sudden they're constrained uh, and they're having to behave in this way. But other than in these superficial cuts right now that I have in this, mm -hmm. I don't, I can't tell you, but literally if you come back to me next week, I, I will have the data <laughs> finished up and coded and we can talk more about it. Uh, but I think this speaks to what, what people are, are interested in about what's going on at the judge level. And I think part of this is we just wanted to show you what happened at the policy level, yes. uh, but it's so interesting that it, we have to at least acknowledge that there's stuff going on uh, down at the other end. So I, I, so I appreciate that. Well, I think we should give you a big I love it. I'll take it. <laughs>